I struggle badly with wanting to constantly upgrade my camera collection to try out new pieces of film photography gear, to purchase new filmmaking gear. And I've recently noticed that the majority of film cameras which I actually own, I simply don't use enough. Today, I'm going to run through every stills film camera which I own, how I came about to own those cameras, what I use them for, and realistically, if I need or should be keeping them in my collection. Let's get into it. Now, I'm going to follow in somewhat of a chronological order here, following along roughly the timeline in which I picked up each camera. Now, I can't be certain exactly when I did start shooting with each camera because they've accumulated over a few years, so this may not be 100% accurate, but starting off with one that I'm very sure is my absolute first film camera, the Canon A1. <laughs> Canon A1 was actually my dad's film camera and he began to use it more and more sparingly, I guess, in his life. And when I was properly getting into photography and videography and finishing university and deciding what I wanted to do with my life, he decided to pass it on to me. And this camera was what I used to shoot my very first roll of film. In December of 2019, I traveled to Los Angeles with my friend Joe on a work trip. We were just working as freelance videographers and the Canon A1 came with me on that trip with a little old Tamron Zoom lens that I'm not actually sure I have anymore, but immediately I fell in love with the process of shooting film and with using the Canon A1. Also, it's clearly an incredible camera. I've never been disappointed with the images that I get from it straight away, even from that very first roll of film that I shot. I loved it so much that I went to a used camera store in LA and I purchased the 50 millimeter F1.4 FD lens that currently lives on the A1 and it's what I've used a lot. I'm a little ashamed to say that I don't use the camera as much as I should do anymore. It has been slightly replaced as the first camera that I reach for when I'm shooting 35 millimeter, but for obvious reasons, this is a camera that is absolutely going to stay in my collection until hopefully I pass it on to somebody else maybe later on in my life. And I absolutely will find some new reasons to take the camera out and about and create some more images with it soon. Up next is a camera that I picked up really cheap, but I think it's actually been growing in popularity and thus in price a little bit in recent years, and that's the Olympus Trip 35. I've made a full video on this camera on my channel before, so I'll leave a link to that down below, but this camera is what I would consider to be the ultimate beginner's walk around film camera. It is so incredibly simple to use, it's fully mechanical and so doesn't require any batteries. It's auto exposure light meter and tools work really well and once you get your head around the focusing system it is just incredibly easy to get sharp high quality photos. That's helped by the incredible 40mm f2.8 lens that is very high quality that is in the Trip 35 and although it is a little bit of a tighter perspective for my liking generally I would prefer something more like a 28 or a 35 40 mil is an incredibly versatile focal length for a multitude of photography settings and that's why I think it's a good all-around beginner's camera. It even has a shoe mount on top of the camera where you can mount a flash if you want to. This camera just for sure is staying in my collection. I picked it up for like £30 a few years back and it's still very simple and easy and fun to shoot with and I think they can fetch upwards of like £75 or something secondhand on selling sites now but I'll still use this occasionally as a walk-around camera like I said and it's definitely something that I want to create more work with. For me, it's the ultimate beginner film camera, and so the Trip 35, it's staying. Up next, we have our first foray into medium format photography, and it's actually with a camera that I haven't really shown much on the channel or actually shot that much with, and that's the Hasselblad 500C. Now, this Hasselblad 500C was actually gifted to me by an old friend who came into possession of the camera after it was being used for years as a prop in a college theater in New York. It's a little random, I guess, how it ended up in my hands, but I'm incredibly grateful that it did. Yes, it is a little bit beat up and incredibly well used, but it actually works remarkably well considering how it looks from the outside, or at least it did. I haven't shot it in about a year. I'm hoping too soon, but I probably need to put a couple test rolls through it first. I did have to replace the light seals after testing it out originally as it had a lot of light leaks, but other than that, it has actually worked pretty flawlessly so far. Admittedly, as I said, the 500C is a camera that definitely doesn't get the use that it should, 
out of me, the other medium format cameras which I have tend to take precedent and I think that ultimately comes down to being just a lot less comfortable shooting a square format image. I've got a shoot and a video planned that I do think the 500C would be perfect for so I'm looking forward to shooting with it soon and I hope to really discover how best to utilize it going forward but so far it's just it's just a little underused for me. As I said, this was a gift to me, so it carries some sentimental weight and it's clearly just a beautiful camera to have around and something that I really wanna learn and dive a bit more deeper into. So the Hasselblad 500C, as much as I haven't used it, it's definitely staying and something that I will be using in the future. My next camera purchase was the biggest film camera purchase that I think I've made to date, actually. My most expensive camera and one of my dream cameras. And that was the Mamiya RZ67 Pro. Now this camera I've made a few videos with on the channel now and it's very much one of my most loved cameras to shoot with. I've mainly used it to shoot portraits and for that purpose this is the best medium format camera that I could ever wish to purchase. I don't think I would ever need to replace it if I'm shooting portraits. I own two lenses for the RZ67 system being the 180mm f4.5 and the 90mm f3.5. I've used them both for portrait work, they both have a place in my workflow and as nice as a lens like the 110mm f2.8 looks, I just can't really justify spending that sort of money when I have perfectly usable alternatives already. I do also have a few accessories for the camera, which I don't tend to use too regularly, actually. The eye level viewfinder is very useful, and that's one that I have, but I do wish it had a built-in magnifier like the waist level viewfinder does, and I also have a power winder, sort of auto advancer type thing, which I've actually never used. The handle, which attaches to the base and allows me to fire the shutter with my left hand, and just makes it a little bit easier to handheld and use out sort of in the field as opposed to holding the sort of big box makes it very useful. Again, I do tend to use that a decent amount. The downsides of the RZ and this camera system in general is just how big and clunky it is. Sometimes I have to shoot with it on a tripod. It's not particularly easy to travel with or just take out and walk around and shoot some photos, but the image quality that you can get out of this thing is simply incredible. I do have another 6x7 camera which I'm going to talk about next, but the Mamiya for me is just the absolute pinnacle of image quality which I've been able to achieve in terms of generally just shooting photography as a whole. It's the best images I've ever got and it does have some sentimental value in it. Being my first real big film camera purchase, my first actual purchase of a medium format film camera. For now, I'm not looking to move on from it, but the camera that has made me think about moving on is my Pentax 6.7. Now we are jumping out of chronological order here a little bit as the Pentax 6.7 is one of my much more recent purchases but it shoots the same film negative size as the RZ 6.7 and so for me it made more sense to talk about it here. The Pentax 6.7 I purchased to be a more portable high quality medium format option as at the time I was looking at shooting a little bit more landscape work, trying out medium format film in a slightly different capacity to the portrait heavy sort of stuff which I'd done so far. The clunky usability and massive nature of the Mamiya was not as optimal for me, so the Pentax 6.7 seemed like the perfect option to replace that. And as much as I'd loved a system like the Mamiya 7 or even the Plowable Machina 6.7, the Pentax 6.7, and I got the mirror lockup version, was a much more budget-friendly option. I actually just own the one lens for it, which is the 75mm f4.5, and I don't own any accessories for it other than this nifty little 3D printed grip extender on the right-hand side of the camera, which does make it more comfortable to use handheld and I would recommend to any Pentax owner. If I'm honest, it's kind of transpired that I haven't used the Pentax 6.7 nearly as much as I'd have liked to. I don't get out to shoot landscapes particularly often now. I bought it to take some out in America, which I did when I was out there on a trip and I used the Pentax for a portrait shoot more recently, but landscapes, I guess in England, I just don't tend to find particularly inspiring and I don't have the time to do massive road trips, so I haven't found shooting with it that often. And if I am gonna shoot some portraits, as I said, I tend to reach for the Mamiya just because I love the image quality that it gives me and the workflow for, for shooting portraits. That being said, however, the images that this thing produce are always stellar in both the landscape and portrait capacity that I've used it. It is quick, it's easy, it's 
probably more convenient than the Mamiya RZ67. And I am heading over to the US again over the summertime and doing a bit of traveling a bit more this time. So I should be able to take it on some trips with me to some national parks, things like that, and try and get some more landscapes. So for that reason, I'm gonna be keeping a little bit longer. If I find that when I'm back from the US later in the year, this camera is again, just surplus to my needs, at least while I'm based in England, I think it's definitely a candidate to be moved on from compared to the RZ67. That being said though, this does have the slight dual aspect ability of being able to do both portraits and landscapes easier. So it's definitely a decision there to be made. Up next, we have my favorite film camera that I own, the Contax G1. The Contax G1 for me is just the ultimate 35 millimeter film camera. I'm sure the G2 actually does improve upon the G1's capabilities, but from my experience, it, it kind of needs no improving in my eyes. I only have one lens for it, which is the 28 millimeter f2.8, and this camera and lens combo has been just my go-to for 35 millimeter since I purchased it. It's pretty much the only thing I pick up. I've used it for some portrait shoots that are sort of more environmentally portraits, some wide angle stuff, particularly when paired with the Contax TLA140, which is a little flash unit. I love the look that that gives. I've used it for everyday walk around style shooting and documentation. I've used it at family weddings and parties to document those sorts of things again with that flash. And I really can't think of many, if any, faults. The autofocus system does get a lot of flack and a lot of people find that they have issues with it, but I generally think that probably under 1% of the photos that I've taken with this thing have come back out of focus. Once you get used to the focusing system, it is so incredibly easy to use. And yes, this is my experience with just the one lens. Maybe other lenses like the 45 millimeter, more shots, maybe they do end up out of focus. But in my experience with the gear that I have, that is all I can base it on, it is incredibly easy to use and to get images that are sharp and in focus. The automatic exposure tools always work great. I can trust it's gonna give me a good exposure. The lens is incredible quality. It is so sharp. It's like shooting medium format in a 35 millimeter body. The viewfinder is maybe the tiniest bit small, but I don't really have any issues using it, walking it around. And it is just a joy to carry around with you and shoot with wherever you go. Plus the camera is probably as aesthetically pleasing as a camera can be. It feels solid. It's the perfect sort of size and weight in my hands, but it's small and comfortable enough to carry around all day if you wanted to and to travel with. I really don't have enough good things to say about the Contax G1. To date, thankfully, it stayed fully functional and working, and I know that they can sort of give up at any point. So if this body does decide to break on me at some point in the future, I can say I'd be purchasing a replacement within the hour. That is how much I love this thing. Clearly, this one is here to stay. And now we move on to what I would say is the final camera in my core camera collection, I guess. The cameras that I use more regularly and will always see myself finding a useful. And that last camera is the Canon EOS 3. The Canon EOS 3 I purely use as a 35 millimeter portrait camera. It's an EF mount and so takes the same lenses that my Blackmagic Pocket 6K Pro takes. And for that reason alone, it's the most logical 35 millimeter film camera to use for portrait work. It feels much closer to a digital camera when using it. The autofocus is always fast and this model actually has eye autofocus. Not like how we have eye autofocus in a lot of modern day cameras, what I'm recording this with now, obviously it's just focusing on my eye. The viewfinder on the EOS 3 registers where you're looking in the viewfinder and it focuses on that focusing point. You do have to sort of calibrate it to your eye and it's a little bit finicky at first, but it's actually a pretty nifty autofocus tool and it works surprisingly well. Because the final image in film photography is simply about the film stock that you use and the lens with which you expose, the images which I've gotten out of the US 3 are always exceptional. You choose a good film stock, you use a high quality EF lens, you're never going to be disappointed with the results. They're some of the sharpest, again, 35mm film scans that I've ever had. And of course, you can get some lovely portrait renderings due to using some high quality EF lenses, things with like apertures of f1.4, etc. You can really shoot wide open and really blur that background. This camera works out. I guess is a fairly economical purchase because I already had a wealth of lenses to use for it. So I just had to buy the body and some batteries. And it's a camera that I'll be keeping around for sure a little bit longer as I want to shoot more portraits on 35 millimeter film. So now we move on to what I would sort of say is the more 
experimental, I guess, YouTube focused and less regularly used cameras. Some of these I purchased purely to put a few rolls through as a sort of first impressions video, a review type video. Some I purchased purely to test out and I haven't even made videos on them. And some of them actually ended up not working at all. We'll start off with a couple of cameras that I've made videos on, but that I haven't used for any purposes other than for YouTube. And that is the Rito Ultra Wide and Slim and the Kodak Ektar H35. Now, both of these cameras I found to be perfectly acceptable walk around beginner film cameras. They're incredibly simple. They have plastic lenses. The XR H35 is of course a half frame camera and so is twice as economical, but in my eyes, they both fall into the same category. If you're after a first film camera that you simply have to point at what you want to take a photo of and any conscious photographic decision-making from a technical perspective is taken out of your hands, then these cameras work just fine. They're light, they're small, they're convenient, but the image quality is going to be drastically lower and the photographic process is going to be far more automatic than some of the cameras that I've already mentioned. They were fun to try out for some videos, they made some okay images and now they're my go-to camera if a friend wants to shoot a roll of film or something like that. I don't need to keep them but I also doubt there's much of a second-hand market for selling things like these as they were quite cheap already in the first place so I guess for now they're staying around and being used on the odd occasion. Up next is a couple of cameras which I don't actually believe work, which I picked up really cheap. One is a 35mm film camera and the other is a medium format camera. And they are the Olympus AF-1 and the Bronica ETRS. <laughs> The Olympus AF-1 I purchased literally for like £5 off Facebook Marketplace. They sold it as untested and lo and behold, it didn't work. I uh, I don't know why, it's, you know, I haven't got around to looking at it or anything or sending it off anywhere for £5. I'm not sure it was worth it. So since then, it's become a shelf decoration. But the Bronica, on the other hand, looks to actually be in really quite excellent condition. I got it from my grandfather, who obviously hasn't used it in years, but has kept it well sealed away for years and years. And as such, it's in a pretty excellent condition externally. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, the film back doesn't wind and advance after shooting each frame so you can wind it on the side but it doesn't connect to the film back. I'm hoping to send it off for like a proper diagnosis and CLA soon. Maybe it's just a case of getting a different film back for it but unfortunately until that point and I do that the camera remains unusable. Obviously it's another more sentimental camera because it came from my grandfather and so I'll definitely be keeping it. Hopefully it doesn't take too much money to get it fixing in the future and if we do then absolutely it is a camera that I will test out and try and use because again it's quite a nice little compact medium format camera system. And that brings us to the final two cameras which I own and they are two cameras which are going to be having their own videos very shortly on the channel. They could become part of the collection or they could very easily end up the way of the Kodak and the Rito and simply never be shot again. <laughs> These two cameras are the Ricoh Mirai 105 and the Yashica Electro 35MC. Now I've actually owned both these cameras for a little while but I haven't found the time to shoot with them but that has actually changed recently for the Ricoh. As, as of recording this I shot a couple of rolls of Fuji C200 through the Mirai 105 earlier this week and I've this morning sent them off to my lab to be developed and scanned. It's certainly a funny little camera to use. It's not particularly orthodox 35mm film camera and it was a slightly different shooting experience so I'm excited to share that with you you soon. And the Electro 35 I purchased because I loved shooting with the Olympus Trip 35 and the Electro 35 seems to me like a slightly smaller alternative with a few more manual exposure tools and obviously I love the Olympus Trip 35 as being the ultimate beginner's film camera so my plan is to sort of compare the two to one another in a video in the future and that's why for now the Yashica also stays on my shelves but hopefully very soon we'll have some rolls of film going through it. And that is it for my camera collection. There is definitely too many you don't have to tell me I know there is almost all of them don't get the amount of film rolls shot through them as I'd like and some of them I definitely have no real legitimate reason to keep and yeah still I hold on to them and I know I'm not alone in this regard I'm certainly not a collector of film cameras but for me it was like when I got my first tattoo almost immediately I wanted another one even if I had no reason or meaning to get one some of these cameras I have no reason or meaning to own I simply wanted to shoot a couple of rolls of film through them and I do realistically need to sit down and look at the collection and think realistically what do I need to keep let me know if you were in my position what cameras would you keep or would you sell would you sell any of them would you sell pretty much all of them or perhaps do you even have recommendations for cameras that I'd enjoy shooting 
based on what I've already spoken about today. I'd love to hear from you if you do. If you enjoyed the video, please do feel free to leave me a like and maybe consider subscribing if you want to see more of my content. I've got plenty of film photography stuff coming up and already on my channel and some videos all about videography and filmmaking as well. So do take a look at the channel if you want to see some of those. Stay safe everyone, stay happy and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.